to introduce our final speaker, Dr. Moti Freeman from um, Philips Healthcare. So, uh, Dr. Freeman is a staff research scientist at Philips Healthcare, where he is developing advanced algorithms with the aim of improving capacity of medical imaging devices to provide clinically meaningful information by leveraging machine learning, computer vision, and image processing algorithms. Um, Dr. Freeman will talk about uh, the invisible becomes quantifiable in coronary computed tomography and geography exams with CTFFR. So Welcome. thank you for the introduction. As I, I, I would say that my main goal is to keep you in while the coffee is out. So I'll give it a try. Um, so Hila already introduces the, uh, the concept of cardiac imaging and the importance of it. And uh, Tam introduced MRI and uh, its challenges like uh, uh, the time that acquisition is taking. And uh, CIT is trying to uh, aim to solve these two problems together, so it's m way much faster than uh, MRI, and it can, could, at least can, tackle some of the uh, cardiac imaging challenges. And this is what I walk to, walk, would like to uh, talk about today. And I'll take you in a different direction uh, that, uh, compared to what previously presented, I will talk about what is not visible in the images rather than what is visible. So, briefly speaking, our focus is on coronary artery disease, which is the main leading cause for deaths globally, account for more than 8 million deaths in 2013 only. Uh, the key idea here is that uh, the cardiac muscle is surrounded by the coronary arteries, which their goal is to supply blood to the, coronar to the cardiac muscle. However, as we're eating more and more, some plaque is developed uh, within the coronary and essentially block the blood supply uh, into the coronaries, into the cardiac muscle. From time to time, it can be uh, partial uh, blocking, and then we will have some uh, chest pain. But at some point, it can uh, develop into a total blocking of the uh, blood supply to the cardiac muscle, and then the cardiac tissue can die, and that's what we call heart attack. So, uh, the, usually, uh, the usual presentation of a patient is, uh, as we all know, uh, someone went to gym, did some uh, 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 jogging on, on the treadmill, feel some chest pain, go to the hospital, and then we had some uh, non-invasive exams like uh, ECG, stress test, so on, and uh, the indicator is that uh, there is something in. And the best solution is to take the patient into a non-invasive imaging to see what they're actually in. And one potential option, which can be considered a good option, is cardiac CT. Uh, this is how cardiac CT looks like uh, in a patient with a chest pain. So basically, we can see uh, the cardiac muscle. And because we injected contrast material, in the case of CT, it can be iodine uh, solution, we will see uh, the coronary arteries highlighted in bright. This is, for example, one coronary artery. This is other coronary artery. You can see the branch here. And uh, we will see the calcified plaque will appear. The calcified plaque will appear in bright uh, in this region, for example. And this causes a partial blocking of the blood supply to the muscle. And here is a nice example of a soft plaque, which basically a fatty plaque, which not developed yet to a calcified plaque. And both cause narrowing of the uh, coronary diameter and essentially limited the blood supply to the cardiac muscle. So if we see a patient with uh, um, such uh, a presentation, we would like to ask ourselves whether we should, how we should treat this patient. And basically, there are two options. One is uh, to give the patient uh, medications and treat him non-invasively. And the other option is to treat him invasively in what uh, we call uh, stent placing, uh, which is an invasive procedure. So we need to decide how we treat this patient. So the common way to do that is basically to quantify the disease as presented by the uh, city, city uh, angiography. 
And the key measurement that is commonly used is a stenosis percentage. Basically, measuring the amount of stenosis uh, presented in the coronary. So here I put uh, two vessels. The left one uh, is, uh, uh, well, it's, you, yeah, it's the left one is, um, is in a healthy vessel, and it's very easy to see that there is no blocking, there is no narrowing. And basically, the ratio between the area of the lumen and the vessel wall is very close to one. So one minus this ratio will be close to zero, and that means healthy vessel. In the right side, you can see uh, a vessel with coronary artery disease, so you can see quite easily the plaque here and here. And basically, the ratio between the vessel lumen area, where the blood can flow, and the vessel wall is uh, close to zero, and one minus this ratio will be close to one, which means severe disease. So that's one option, and we can do that quite easily. We have a lot of algorithmic tools to segment the vessel lumen and the vessel wall, and uh, we can calculate this measure. However, several studies showed that more than 50% of patients that classified with severe disease that require uh, uh, invasive treatment actually is not, uh, turned out not to be, uh, uh, to be not a severe disease while they treated. So th that means that we are doing a lot of non-invasive, a lot of invasive procedures that are actually unnecessarily. And the reason for that is very simple, because the body or the disease is not directly related to the level of stenosis or the narrowing of the coronary arteries. What is the actual factor that is cause the disease that or the implication of the disease is the lack of blood supply to the cardiac muscles. So we are interested in how much blood was supplied to the cardiac muscle. We're measuring the coronary diameter. Two different measurements might be related, but not to the level of accuracy that we would like to. So basically, we would like to reduce the amount of unnecessary invasive coronary angiography interventions. How clinicians actually measure the severity of the disease invasively? They use a different measure called fractional flow reserve, which associated with the ratio between the blood pressure before, uh, between, before and after the coronary lesion. So blood pressure is a good indicator to the amount of the blood, of the, to the amount of the blood supplied to the uh, cardiac muscle. So that's a measure that we know how to measure. There are pressure wires produced by different companies uh, that we can use. The only problem is that this is an invasive procedure. It's expensive. It's exposed the patient to additional risk. So we would like to avoid that. The key idea is to transform the coronary computed tomography and geography exam from an anatomical exam that can quantify only the vessel diameter to a functional imaging modality that can provide information about the amount of blood that actually is supplied to the cardiac muscle. And we call it CTFFR. FFR measurement derived from non-invasive uh, CT exam. And we can do that by combining several components. So first, we need the CT data. From the CT data, we need to extract the anatomical uh, a tree, a coronary tree, or basically or a geometrical model of the coronary tree. We can do it in several stages, first to roughly extract the tree, then to do accurate, fine segmentation of the coronary arteries. Then we need to design, um, sorry for that, uh, we need to design, about to assign a boundary condition model and to develop a flow simulation tool that enable us to actually simulate the blood flow within the coronaries, and from that we will be able to derive uh, the fractional flow reserve, hopefully uh, improve CCTA specificity uh, in detecting severe coronary artery disease. In the talk, I'll focus specifically only on the uh, segmentation aspects of the projects. People who are interested in other aspects of the, pro of the projects uh, we, uh, can look for them online 
we, uh, they are described in several scientific papers we published and which and these are publicly available. So generally speaking, our, the input to the uh, coronary tree modeling is uh, city data with already extracted or computed uh, coronary center lines. Then we have a cylindrical uh, sampling of the volume around the coronaries. Then we develop a machine learning based approach to estimate uh, the likelihood of each point to belong to the coronary or not. And we have additional component accounting for partial volume effects. Finally, we plug this model into a graph MinCAD framework and get the final segmentation. So we use a quite simple tool based on uh, the k-nearest neighbor approach to calculate the likelihood of each point. We have basically one-dimensional intensity profiles perpendicular to the vessel, so we can detect the boundary. And in our database, we have uh, an expert marks that, annota that annotated uh, the lumen and the vessel wall, so we can basically uh, learn a model that use that. In the case of the k-nearest neighbor, neighbor algorithm we are doing in a, fashion, in a lazy fashion, which means we calculate the probability for each ray in the test by using all the training data at the time. Once we use it, we can get the likelihood of each point in the uh, case that uh, is presented to, uh, to be within the lumen or in the wall. Because the coronary diameters can be very, very small, even below one millimeter, they might be below the system overall resolution. So we need to account specifically for partial volume effect, which can cause to several vessels to be uh, presented like a much larger or with larger diameter vessel. And we did that by developing additional algorithm that identify degradation in the intensity uh, in specific regions. For, you, for example, you can see here the intensity profile along the vessel, and you can see here that there is a, a decrease in the intensity, which means that the uh, smoothing kernel using the reconstruction spread the intensity from the lumen out, uh, outwards, and we got uh, expanded diameter in price of decreased intensity. So we learn how to detect these regions, and we correct for the uh, presented diameter using a predefined model. Finally, we feed uh, the likelihood map to a two layers uh, graph problem, where each layer present representing a different separation. So one, the first layer represents the separation between the lumen wall and the, uh, the, the coronary wall and the background. And the second internal layer represents the separation between the coronary lumen and the coronary wall. And we know how to solve this problem in a globally optimal uh, mean. And the solution uh, basically give us segmentation of simultaneous segmentation of both the uh, coronary wall from the background and the coronary lumen from its wall. So this is how it looks like in the graph. And when we look on it on the, uh, sorry, uh, an additional aspect of the algorithm is that because we used um, a lazy evaluation by k-nearest neighbor, the size of the database is very important and have a lot of implications on the running time and also accuracy. So we develop a further optimization strategy that enable us to optimize the database that is actually deployed in the product to achieve both high performance in terms of running time and also high accuracy by eliminating non-informative samples from the uh, database. Here are some examples of the uh, coronary segmentation results we, we get using this algorithm. So uh, the red contour represents the coronary lumen boundary and the blue contour represents the coronary wall uh, boundary, which may include uh, calcified or soft plaques that is presenting. We evaluated this algorithm on a publicly available database from the Mikai 2012 challenge, and uh, we got uh, very nice results. Actually, the best results in uh, most of the uh, parameters, given the center lines that are used in this competition. Um, 
when we integrated all the components, including the boundary condition and flow simulation uh, uh, components in the, uh, in the of, uh, related to this application. And here you can see an example of uh, a coronary vessel with some stenosis with soft plaque here. And here you can see the uh, FFR estimates color coded on the three-dimensional three mesh of the coronary tree. In this, sorry, in this case, the lesion is not severe and the CT FFR value is above 0 0.8, which is considered the clinical threshold. In this case, it turned out that the uh, stenosis, were, the lesion were more, was more severe and uh, we got an FFR estimate of 0 0.6, which is way below the clinical threshold of 0 0.8. When we compared the performance of stenosis measurements and CT FFR measurements using invasive FFR measurements as a reference, we saw that stenosis measurements, as we already know, perform very bad in predicting severe coronary disease. However, by using CT FFR estimates, we got very high accuracy in predicting uh, predicting uh, severe coronary artery disease, which actually almost no difference with, between automatic operation of the application and manual operation, where the user was allowed to correct the segmentation uh, that are uh, produced. So in conclusion, uh, our city FFR application enabled on-site non-invasive functional assessment of coronary lesions from anatomical CTA data. The application has the potential to reduce substantially unnecessary non-invasive, uh, so, sorry, and to reduce substantially unnecessary invasive uh, coronary interventions which expose the, the patient to additional radiation and risk and of course uh, additional cost. The automatic coronary segmentation algorithm which is a component, key component in this system ena enable us to achieve a human level uh, performance with the application. This project uh, is a result of a international collaboration between uh, our lab in uh, Haifa, the City Global Advanced Technology Group, headed by uh, Liran Goshen and uh, me as a staff scientist there. Our uh, collaborate our colleagues from the Philips Research Lab at Hamburg and uh, clinical scientists from our uh, site in Cleveland, Ohio. We also would like to thank to our clinical collaborators, including Dr. Rubinstein from Carmel Hospital in Haifa and additional uh, international collaborators from various uh, countries and uh, sites. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for maybe one question. Anyone? Okay. I guess everything is clear. Thank you, Moti, and uh, let's uh, again thanks all the speakers again. And uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you.